Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining today's event. I'm Jason Gumpert from msdynamicsworld.com and I'm excited to be hosting today for an hour that should be packed with uh, information and also hopefully a little bit of fun. Um, this is going to be a fast-paced event. We have um, five main presenters today and I will get to them in just a moment um, to give you a sense of how today's event will flow. We have uh, presentations from um, five different experts talking about their areas of, uh, well, of expertise. And we will also have time for questions from you in the audience. Um, you can ask questions at any point. Look for the Q&A block to the right of the main presentation window. If you don't see it, uh, look for a, a question mark icon to enable that. And uh, like I said, we will um, be saving a few minutes at the end to take those. And um, if there are specific questions for one um, one presenter from or one company, that would be great. If you have more general questions, those are great too that you want everyone to kind of deal with. Um, but you really get it. And I think one of the nice things about today's hour is you're going to get a really great mix of different, uh, but also all very highly valuable capabilities um, that, that should be re relevant to you um, and your own or your clients, um, Dynamics 365 for Finance and Operations or Dynamics AX Solution. Uh, so here are our presenters today. Um, this is also the order we're going to be uh, be hearing from them uh, in. Uh, and uh, I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, we're going to move sort of right, right from one to the next um, as swiftly as we're able. Each presenter will have 10 minutes. So um, let's get started. I'm going to hand things off to Asan Dineshkar of AX Source to uh, be our first presenter. So uh, Asan, I am giving you control. Let's just make sure your line is open. Perfect. All right. Share my screen. Yep, but we see that. Okay, great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Esan, and I'm a solution development consultant at Axsource. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about our organic compliance suite uh, for cannabis and uh, other agri businesses. Uh, a little bit about our company. Uh, is this blocking the screen? I should move this around. No, it's not. Oh, perfect. So, uh, so Axsource, we have three distinct areas of practice: our IT and digital transformation services. Uh, it's basically a Microsoft partner. Uh, we implement AX, NAV, and Dynamics 365. Uh, we also have another area, uh, completely different. Uh, we provide regulatory assurance and quality uh, services for regulated industries, pharma, life sciences, medical device, anything from audit, uh, inspections, submissions. And uh, through the collaboration, basically, of these two teams, uh, we were able to build some products. And we have an ISV practice which uh, we are selling basically uh, ERP add-ons. Uh, for pharma life sciences, we have a GMP compliance. Uh, for cannabis, we have a full ERP uh, for cannabis that takes care of everything from the cultivation all the way to the packaged products, anything that an ERP has, plus some cannabis-specific areas, uh, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have a retail solution and a hospitality, which is very interesting for uh, food courts, airports, and shopping malls. Uh, about our company, we also, uh, in some projects, we uh, partner with other companies uh, because of our expertise in regulatory space. Uh, we act as the ISP uh, provider and the regulatory consultants, and uh, the other partner will usually take care of the Microsoft uh, side of the things. Uh, I'll just jump into the next slide. Uh, our OCS solution, as I said, it's a complete ERP for cannabis. Uh, what differentiates us, and I'm just going to go over that mainly today, is that first there are lots of uh, point solutions in the market uh, where, where the, our product is basically a full ERP solution, so it's not just taking care of tracking or order fulfillment, it's an ERP. And between the ERP products available in the market, uh, again, what differentiates us is the quality management piece. We have expertise in the regulatory quality space, and we have uh, built all those uh, 
pieces that are required for this industry and are missing from standard ERPs. Uh, first one is production quality management. Uh, standard Dynamics has uh, quality management, but a lot of it is taking care of basically the finished product. It's uh, when the production is over at the time of registration, whereas this industry requires a lot of checks and quality control during the production and some mechanisms to stop the production or take some measures if there are any deviations. Environmental monitoring is another uh, type of checks that they have to do during production and document everything. Deviation control. Electronic signatures. Uh, the standard functionality in Dynamics, but we have extended uh, to make it in compliance with regulatory requirements. Uh, there are a lot of areas that uh, multiple sign-ups are required. As an example, in a grow room, a master grower or a production worker can sign up on a specific thing and then uh, a responsible person in the room or a quality manager needs to sign up on the same thing. So we, we have it designed in a way that can be triggered in multiple points uh, to make it uh, in compliance with the regulatory requirements. Capital management to take care of all the deviations and incidents. Uh, electronic batch records, a huge plus for companies that are still using paper records or uh, they're using an external software uh, to capture this. Uh, still, I would say a lot of companies are working on paper records. Electronic batch records will basically document any process, anything that you're mentioning in your ERP and in your quality processes will keep electronic record of it. Approved customer. Uh, very important for this industry in terms of uh, which customers are basically allowed to buy what type of products or what what's the dosage that they are uh, approved to buy. And recall management uh, helps them to quickly identify the products where they are and take action based on that. Uh, some of the examples of uh, things we can do with our production quality management is the in-production in instructions. Uh, which I'm going to show you, equipment testing, weighing, reconciliation, bulk and yield, and also labeling. Uh, so in the first one, uh, I'm just going to show you how we can take care of production instructions. This is an example for production uh, where we're moving plants from one room to another room, which happens a lot. Uh, in certain operations like this one, production workers are required to uh, do some checks before uh, actually starting the moving plants. Uh, here's the instructions or things that SOP is requiring, verifying all the tables are properly positioned, checking that irrigation valves are in off position. Production workers can uh, choose a status pass or fail for each of them, and uh, uh, there will be a, a time and date stamp performed by, and if there are anything that uh, is not basically based on the requirements they can issue with deviation. And in here, we can directly create a kappa and also uh, have electronic signatures triggered depending on how the processes are, which I'm going to show you. Uh, next slide. Uh, example of bulk and yield and accountability. Uh, we can add all the information uh, about the production and system will do the calculation for us if it's in the uh, pass or fail range and the responsible person will uh, define the status. We can also issue kappa if there's not up to standards. Uh, environmental monitoring, we can define which location we are doing the monitoring for, uh, what are the uh, areas that we need monitoring for, room temperature, humidity, CO2 level, the specification range, and again, we can define the pass or fail status. And in this example, let's say we have, uh, we are going to issue a kappa for uh, this fail status. We can immediately start creating a deviation, and after that, we'll have a kappa form over here for us. Kappa form will open. We will define which category or subcategory it belongs to, date, description, or even the priority. So if there's this is a high priority one that we can't stop the production because of that, 
we can uh, mention that high end production, uh, sorry, uh, quality management people will take care of that after. Uh, here's where we have defined that electronic signature must be triggered uh, so that we make sure not every person can create a kappa. Uh, this is only uh, based on the users and how we define it. Uh, once the kappa is created, uh, we can go through a kappa process, uh, define investigators and reviewers. They will uh, receive notifications on what kind of actions they need to take. Uh, they can go through the process by defining the problem and adding investigation detail. They can attach anything that they would like over here. Uh, and then the next step, they can define the root cause. And the next step for a capital use, usually we need to define the corrective action or preventive action user. And if they have any kind of uh, time limitation that they really have to take the action on. Uh, and ends usually by reviewing the CAFA. Uh, this is our recall form where we can do a recall for a specific product. If we have any more information about that product, the date range that was the production happened on, batch number, the classification, and the system will tell us where the products are. Uh, in this example, we have two quantities sold outside the company and we have 23 units inside we can see where those quantities are, which sales order they belong to, which batch number. And finally, I just wanted to quickly show you uh, two workspaces for our cultivation and quality management where we can see all the information for our space planning down to the table or row level, how much space we have utilized and how much space we have. We can see our job lists, uh, how many jobs we have for the day or for that uh, production facility, and also a quality management workspace where we can see all the CAPAs and recalls issued, uh, just to have an overview of everything. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I think my time is over. All right, thank you, Hassan. And uh, we will be putting up contact information at the end of uh, the session as well when we do Q&A as well. OK, I'm going to change things over now to um, Neil from Binary Stream. And Neil, you looks like your line is open. Okay, and my screen should be coming up here momentarily. Oh, there it is. Yes. Okay. So what I want to talk about today, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to everyone, is a small piece of our subscription billing suite over the course of these webinars. We're actually uh, showcasing different functionalities as part of our subscription billing suite for uh, D365 Finance and Operations. What I want to look at today is a small portion of that, the ability to manage deferrals. A lot of our customers are telling us that they're having to run their deferrals by bringing the, the invoices uh, from D365 out to Excel, manage the deferral schedules out there, build those waterfalls, and then on a journal entry basis, bring it back in at the end of each period. What ends up happening, though, is that some of those become very difficult to manage. There's two different types of deferrals that we can manage in our subscription billing suite. Of course, we have the straight line, the ratable calendar base. There's different names for that, where basically, as you can see in this uh, screenshot, we have an amount for April, May, June, July, and it just slides nice and easily across the calendar. Those are fairly easy to manage in Excel. You drop your dollars and divide by 12, 24, 36, whatever the schedule happens to be. But if you get hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of those, now you've got massive spreadsheets that you have to manage. We've also had customers tell us that their deferrals are not quite that simple. They're based on milestones. For example, I actually had a customer that came to me a while back. They were selling these hardware systems, uh, bigger than a PC, smaller than a mainframe. Three things would happen every time they sold one, and they would recognize revenue accordingly. For example, on delivery, they would recognize a certain amount. On implementation, a certain amount. At the end of the training, a certain amount. How do they manage that inside D365? Well, obviously, you can't. Again, it's out in Excel, and there's more spreadsheets that you have to manage. So our subscription billing suite can handle either of those. Let's just look at those in, in a little more detail. We can do the straight line type of deferrals. Here's a couple examples. Suppose you have a service contract that's deferred over the life of the schedule. 
or the life of the contract. So here I have a setup saying, you know, I want to recognize this using a one-year template, recognize a straight line monthly for 12 months. Perhaps we have a situation where the customer is buying an extended warranty. That warranty does not kick in until 12 months after the sale because the factory warranty is on. So in this situation, I can skip 12 months and then recognize the revenue from that extended warranty over the remaining two months. Or another example, and again, a customer came and said, you know, when we sell our stuff, our customers have a 60-day right of return. We don't want to recognize any revenue in that 60-day that period because of the uncertainty. So in that case, we can say, you know, let's skip the first two months, and then we'll recognize revenue over the remaining 10. It's still a 12-month schedule. Now, we can recognize revenue daily. We can recognize it weekly. We can recognize it monthly. Uh, we can do it based on fiscal periods, if your fiscal periods are something like a four-week, four-week, five-week. These examples I'm showing you simply have to be monthly recognition. But this is an example of how we would do it straight line. Here's an example of a schedule where instead of having to take those dollars out to Excel, we can simply say, you know, this is a straight line schedule, and we can see that I've got the amount, in this case, the third column, 29256, is recognized each month. We also have a switch in our setup that allows us to do, instead of straight line like I have here, a per diem type of recognition. So my months with 31 days, like May and July, would get a little more revenue than months like um, June or September that only have 30 days, which in turn we get a little more than February, which is sometimes 28, sometimes 29. We do manage the leap years as well. As it is recognized, we do mark off that yes, this period has been recognized, and we give you the audit trail that you need to go back and look at the information. The, the batch uh, number is in there, the voucher number is in there, so you get the audit trail. But this is all done inside of D365, and of course we have the reports that you can look at, so you can look into the future and forecast on those as well, so you can look at a waterfall report, you can look at a deferral report, a declining balance report, all based on the fact that we're building the schedule inside of D365 finance and operations. Let's talk about the milestone. There's three different ways our milestone recognition works. We can create milestones or events. This is an example of that hardware gentleman that I was telling you about. So I've called this template a hardware template. And what I'm saying is that when I deliver, I want to recognize 50% of the revenue. Of course, I could do this by dollar amount as well. On implementation, I want to recognize 30%. On training, I want to recognize the remaining 20. And this gentleman told me, he says, I know these three things are going to happen, but I don't know when. I'm not really in control of that. It's based on my schedule, my implementer schedule, my customer schedule. So managing these Excel spreadsheets became, these Excel spreadsheets became very difficult for him. We also have the ability to have an expiration account and an automatic expiration in the case of a voucher, um, a Groupon, a training voucher, something like that. If that automatically expires after 12 months, we will automatically we pick up the revenue at that period of time. And of course, we can see where it's going to hit the, the P&L when we move those dollars from the balance sheet to the P&L. So this would be based on milestones or based on events. Percentage of completion, again, I'm simply going to create milestones in there, but as I reach a particular milestone, so my project manager comes in at the end of uh, May and he says, you know, we're at 40% complete. I open up the schedule, put in the date, put in the 40%, and it will recognize the correct amount of revenue. And it continues on. If for some reason project managers sometimes tend to overestimate, so let's say that a couple months later, he's, hey, we're at 80% at the end of June. July, he comes in, he's hanging his head, well, you know what, we're really actually at 70 now. What we're doing is actually booking in the period the full amount. So we reverse the prior and book the full. So in that case, we could decrease by the 10%. So you don't have to keep track of whether it's a positive or negative. What percentage of completion are you at? We will manage it from there. Here's an example of what that schedule might look like. So again, inside of D365, we build the schedule. Notice that there's no dates other than this one. This one I have recognized. But now as I reach the implementation, I'm simply going to modify the schedule, grab the calendar icon or actually key in the date, and it will automatically know to pick up the correct amount of revenue. Again, it will mark it as recognized, and it will drop in the correct account. And if there's any um, of the, I've lost the phrase, sorry, any of the adjustments to the GL account, um, it will pick those up as well. It works with all of those dimensions. That's the word I was looking for. Again, it drops in the date, the journal batch number, and the voucher number so you get the audit trail. You can also see what is sitting there unrecognized at any point in time as well. 
based on a percentage of completion, here's an example where I'm simply going to come in and I'm going to create the milestone by saying here's the date. I'm at 42.5%. It calculates the amount. It then drops that down onto that schedule. When I run my journal entries for the period, it will pick up that amount, the $1,560.81. And again, market is recognized, put in the date, the voucher number, and so on. But all of this is happening inside of D365 FNO. As far as doing the recognition, one single step. I'm simply going to open up the recognition screen, tell it I want to create. You can also reverse the journal entries from here. If you've posted something in error, we can reverse it. Tell it I want to do everything as of, for example, the end of August. I want my transaction date to be the end of August. I simply hit the select button. It goes out and it searches through my entire database and finds everything that needs to be recognized as of this date. Now, this is sample data. Normally, my Aprils, Mays, and Junes, and so on would be picked up. But what's nice about this is it shows you that nothing can be missed. So I'm saying cut off everything as of August 31st. It goes back and looks and says, hey, you forgot to do your recognition last month. I could pause at this point, go back, and just post last month. In this case, I might just want to carry forward. I simply select the recognition criteria, click Select. It finds everything. I just simply click the button at the bottom, the OK button, and all of these journal entries are created. I do have an option to create a summarized journal entry. If I have 10,000 of these lines, I don't want 10,000 journal entries hitting my P&L. I want one summarized entry with a follow-up report. That switch allows that to happen. We can also combine on a sales order or purchase order both deferred and non-deferred items. For example, this hardware is recognized on an event-based basis using that hardware contract. My service contract is straight line over one year. My professional services are, again, percentage of completion, event-based. But there's other items on here, for example, my monthly SaaS software that I don't need to defer. It is a non-deferred item. You can see I can have a combination of deferred and non-deferred on the same invoice. Some other capabilities of our subscription billing suite are the ability to not just create invoices, but actually subscription billing schedules with line level control. And we have various billing types that are available there. For example, I could have a standard item. It should be an item that's sitting in the, the inventory management module, and it brings that in. I can have a usage-based item based on consumption, license counts, minutes on an IVR, professional service hours, something like that, or even milestone billing. I can have different billing frequencies, and I can have different price methods as well. We also have a module that helps with ASC 606 or IFRS 15 compliance. It allows us to define our performance obligations, define the standalone selling prices, and then automatically, as we can see in the second column from the right here, it reallocates the revenue to be in compliance with ASC 606 or IFRS 15. These are all parts of our subscription billing suite. Thank you. Great, thank you, Neil. And uh, our next presenter is going to be Dan Edwards of uh, Crow. So, Dan, I'm going to pass control over to you now. All righty. There we go. Thank you so much, Jason. Yes. And everybody on the phone for joining us. Again, I'm Dan Edwards. I'm a CPA and senior manager here at Crow. What I want to talk to you about today is our Crow Lease Accounting Optimizer for Dynamics 365 as well as for AX 2012. And the Crow Lease Accounting Optimizer is really here to solve a problem that many companies are getting ready to face here at the start of 2019 and 2020, depending on if you're private or public. But there are two new lease accounting standards that the world is facing. Here in the US, under FASB, we're facing what's referred to as ASC Topic 842. And internationally, it's IFRS 16. But what these two standards are doing are taking what we've always known as our lovely operating leases that were very easy for us to manage because they weren't kept on the balance sheet. We simply recorded that lease expense every month. We put some notes or disclosures talking about our lease liabilities, uh, accompanying our financial statements, and that was really all we needed to do. Well, because of that, these standards boards have realized there's kind of some discrepancy between balance sheets of different organizations, and it's really hard to get a good view of what their true liabilities are associated with these leases. 
So that's where they've come up with the standards to actually move these leases onto the balance sheet. But how do I move these leases onto the balance sheet? What is the value of those operating leases? How do I then depreciate? How do I amortize the lease and track all of this information? Well, that's where, you know, as a CPA firm, we've been very involved with this new standard and realize that this is a shortcoming in the dynamic suite of products and worked with Microsoft to develop the Crow Lease Accounting Optimizer. As I said, we built it on top of, so it's an add-in module to D365 and AX2012, built by the experience of our accountants, pretty much everybody on our team, our CPAs, and it's been certified by Microsoft. What it brings to the table is really automating all those calculations that are now going to become necessary. For those that are working with this leasing standard, they're probably very familiar with calculating the present value of those future minimum lease payments. Don't know about you, but I didn't really remember even how to calculate a present value. Thank goodness for Excel having that built in. But if I have a 1,000 leases, do I want to have a 1,000 Excel spreadsheets to track those? There are then new journal entries you're going to have to make, recognizing this asset on the balance sheet, recording the interest expense for the lease, recording the depreciation, recording the payment information. There's other costs such as uh, common area maintenance, insurance, cleaning expenses that you might want to associate with this lease. And of course, there's a whole transition moving to this new standard. So that's what we're able to bring you in the Crow Lease Accounting uh, Optimizer. So let me just go ahead and switch over real quick. Just want to show you here in D365, as I mentioned, this is a module add-in inside of D365. So you can see it appearing right here in my list of modules, as well as having a workspace that I can work from. So I'm going to go ahead and go into that workspace. You'll see this workspace shows me all of my leases. We've really taken the approach to try and tailor this a lot like the fixed asset module. A lot of people have thought, well, maybe I'll just use fixed assets to manage all my leases. But unfortunately, that only handles the asset side. And one thing it doesn't handle is what is the value of the asset. So I'm going to come in here very quickly and just add a new lease. Of course, we do have the ability to import leases. If you're bringing over a 1,000 different leases into the system, you might want to import all those up from Excel. But I can very quickly just come in and enter a sample lease. And there's some key questions that are important for that standard and how I set up this lease. Is it an operating lease? Is it a capital lease? And then what is my rate that I'm using on that lease? So I'm just going to go ahead and enter some of this information here for us, assign it to a group, just like I would assign a fixed asset to an asset group. I'm going to assign this to a lease group. I'm going to tie this to the vendor that I'm going to have to make the monthly, quarterly, annual payments to. So I'll assign this to my property management vendor. And the lease is going to go ahead and start here on let's say August 1st of this year. Once I have that header information, I, as you can see, there's many other fields I can track, but the key is actually tracking the payment of this lease, and that's going to help me calculate the value of the lease. So for the next five years or the next 60 months, and again, you'll notice I have multiple payment frequencies, I can come in here and say we're going to pay $2,500 a month, Maybe after those five years, this lease jumps up to the, for the next two years to 3000 a month. So based on that lease, you can go ahead and enter all the different payment steps. You can actually associate those costs, as I was talking about, to the lease. So I can set up as many different cost types. Maybe I want to set up some insurance expense for this lease. I'm going to go ahead and start that, type in my date right here. Go ahead and start that for the next of 84 months. And I'm only going to pay that once a year for $1,000. And I can pay that either straight to a ledger account or to a vendor. It could be the same vendor that is on this lease, 
or it could be any other vendor that I have set up inside of D365. So I'm going to go ahead and pull out my insurance vendor. And then finally, if I scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see I can also attach all of my financial dimensions. Once I've entered that lease, I simply say create schedules, and the system is now inside of D365, going to go ahead and do all that math, calculate all my present values, create all my schedules, and we can actually track different views of this lease. So I can track this through a transition method. I can track it through the standard method. I can even track it in the current method we're using today, which is called ASC 840. But if I go look at those payment schedules, you'll see here that it has calculated the present value for each one of those payments. You can see it kind of jumps up here as we get down there five years into the lease. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that this lease is $180,000 present value. So I can simply confirm this schedule. Once I've confirmed that schedule, it's now ready to put this on my, my balance sheet by simply saying I want to do my initial recognition. The initial recognition is then creating the journal entry. All the accounts are set up in our posting parameters. So you can control what balance sheet accounts this actually hits. I can actually see that journal entry right from inside the system here. Let my D365 wake up. There we go. I see that it's gone ahead and debited my balance sheet, asset account, and credit my liability account. Now that that is on the books and I have full workflow control over that journal entry, the one thing, once all those assets are set up, now monthly I need to depreciate, I need to record the interest expense, all of that. So I can come out to our batch journal creation. We're working with some clients. One client has as many as 15,000 leases. So they can come in here and simply say, I want to do my payments for a particular time range. I can do my interest expense, my depreciation, and then all of those different expenses simply through this back screen. You can post these in summary. So if you wanted to post three months worth to one period, you could certainly do that. And you can drive all the posting here as well. Finally, the last thing I'd like to show you while we're in the system is that we do have full reporting capability, including all of the disclosure reports, including, including the weighted average discount rate and the weighted average remaining life. We also can help you with some forecasting. Let's say you want to see what are my lease expenses going to be out in 2020. I'm doing some budgeting information, so I could put in that range and the system is actually going to show me what my payments would be in that time frame, my interest, even what my depreciation expense would be. So we have all kinds of reports to help you out with that, as well as having some Power BI capabilities. Let me go ahead and bring up our Power BI dashboard here in my last few seconds so you can see one thing our clients ask a lot is to be able to look across different legal entities to be able to see that is that sometimes difficult inside of D365. But you'll see here on our lease dashboard, I can do all of that. So if you would like to get more information, again, Jason will have all of our contact info. Thanks, Jason. Great. Thank you, Dan. And uh, our next presenter is going to be uh, Anna Tiunin of DUEP. And Anna, I'm going to give you control now. Perfect. Thanks to you, Jason. And that should be showing up now. Yep. Good. So warm welcome from me also. Um, I'm Anna Dunen, and I'm the CPO of DoApp. I've been working with Dynamics and AP softwares pretty much 10 years now, and the last few years in developing and designing DoApp, which is deriving from the Dynamics and AP experience me and my colleagues have. Today, a short introduction to DoApp, but please visit our website also or contact me, uh, doapp at doapp.com, and uh, we can set up a deep dive with you. And I'd love to show you our mobile app, which we unfortunately don't have uh, time, for, uh, time to go through today. Good. So DoApp is an accounts payable automation software designed to integrate with AX and D365 as a turnkey solution. 
It means that we uh, use the master data and set up directly from Dynamics. Technically, that means that we make sure that you're compatible and stay compatible with Dynamics. The standard interfaces are on, or are on us, so to say. From your business process point of view, we do not want to have anything maintained in two places. So Dynamics is your master file and we read the necessary information from there. We integrate with Dynamics by delivering our integration packets to be installed to your D365 or AX2012. And uh, the integration package has all the services that UAP needs. We're also connected to your Azure AD, so that the user authentication is the same as to uh, D365. When you're logged in to Dynamics, you're logged in by single sign-on uh, to do app also. Same credentials are also used with the mobile app. As we have a limited time today, I decided to explain a typical process to you before we go to the actual demo. So your process needs might be slightly different, but I want to give you an example how your future AP process could be. All starting with the invoice data capture, which we provide to you as capture as a service. So don't waste time collecting invoices or uh, in whatever the format is that they are in, and scanning and picking staples and keying in and uh, teaching vendor templates and so on. Just with a single flat rate, you can receive all the invoices as digitalized and with the data captured. You will also have the e-invoice readiness, so the capability to receive invoices in data format, which mitigates the OCR process completely and reduces costs even more. And error is usually to zero. So your working process would start from the opening the do up application where you will find the invoices with the data pegged. Based on the business rules you have, you will have, for example, PO matching automatically or by you validating the three-way matching. And then with the non-PO invoices, you can do coding according, of course, to the account structure that you have in Dynamics. And then by routing the invoices for approval. Approval can be done either with the, or with the desktop application or with the mobile app. And you can also do uh, or modify the coding in the mobile. Approved invoices are then posted automatically or again by your validation to Dynamics. Good. Moving on to the demo, I will switch uh, to my screen here. So what I want to show today is how easy and intuitive DoApp is to use. The power of your application with your Dynamics is to have one centralized view of all your uh, Dynamics legal entities on all your invoice types. You have the opportunity to streamline all group invoices to the same process and then manage by user rights who actually handles those and who can see which company's invoices, for example. So no matter what the invoice type is, which legal entity, uh, the method you, they are sent to you, you will collect them through the same pipeline to the same place. I'm here playing now the role of an AP specialist. Uh, and I here have all now the only, all the invoices that have been digitalized and validated. And all the information here is a combination of the data capture and your Dynamics master data. If you like, uh, human intervention is now needed only for exceptions like matching errors or, or, uh, or coding. Of course, if you want to, uh, validate all the invoices uh, or kind of just handle all the invoices in, in, uh, in the finance department, that is possible too. Good. I'll open the first invoice that I have in my active invoices section. I will see the uh, invoice information. It's a non-PO invoice, so it has coding lines. I can see that invoice's invoice picture on, on, the, on the right side. And if I change the invoice that I'm handling on the left side, the invoice picture will move, uh, will change accordingly, and also the workflow that is related uh, to that uh, selected invoice. I have deliberately done some mistakes in this invoice, so you'll see the intuitiveness that there is. For example, this invoice has couple of, um, a couple of errors, and uh, to see which kind of errors there is, I can uh, click on the warnings that I have and get some more information. For example, it's saying that a mandatory information called uh, a method of payment is missing from the invoice. 
And even though I have that as a hidden field, it's telling me to fill that. This would normally fill, uh, fill out from your uh, vendors table in Dynamics, but for some reason this information is now uh, missing from, from the vendor table and we can add it from here. Good. I adjusted that issue and one of the uh, errors that I had is now gone. The remaining errors are related to coding lines and uh, I also can see here from the coding line section that there is a couple of issues. For example, I have a 10 cent difference in, in the coding and I do have some dimension uh, problems also. From the invoice picture, I can see that I have, for example, in this line, I do have that 10 cents uh, that is our difference. So addressing to that, it is now saying that coding amount is correct. With the uh, dimensions that I have here, as um, um, the account structure in Dynamics is going from left to right, and we might be, the human might be uh, coding from right to left, uh, there is has been an uh, error situation, or for example, the account structure has changed after this coding has been made. So it is saying to me that these dimensions are not allowed with this combination. And uh, if I now go to the incorrect field, it will only give me uh, dimensions that I'm allowed to pick. And by making the correct selections, I'm, I'm, I have now uh, addressed that issue. If the workflow is OK, uh, or if I want to make uh, changes to the workflow, that is also possible. I now made a quick change there, and uh, this invoice is ready to go, and uh, move, I'm moving on to the next invoice. The next invoice I have is a PO invoice, so the whole handling section is now different. As we are pulling the information off your purchase order invoices and the product receipts that you have in Dynamics, and we read this information live, I can see that there is uh, more uh, items on, on the purchase order with all its three packing slips that there is in, in this invoice. I can see that there is again an error that is saying that we have a matching discrepancy. And uh, now to correct this, uh, correct this situation, I can look at the invoice picture, uh, make, uh, make selections to the quantities or make uh, uh, changes to the unit prices, add, for example, miscellaneous uh, charges, or I can, for example, uh, select the correct packing slip that I want to use for, in this matching. I now took a selection of the, of the correct packing slip, and it's reducing uh, the quantities for this invoice that I can use for this matching. Good. Now, when I'm handled this invoice, we have uh, pulled the information from the PO that who are the um, uh, handlers for this, uh, this workflow. And, uh, when I close this invoice, based on the setups that I have in my system, it will uh, either handle this automatically or route it to the reviewers and approvers. Good. That was pretty much all I had, uh, had to show today. And uh, thank you. And hope to uh, do a deep dive demo with you soon. All right. Thank you, Anna. And uh, we are now going to hear from Lindsay Hampson of uh, eBridge Connections. Lindsay, I'm going to make you the presenter now. Great. Thanks. All right. Can you see my screen okay? We can. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I, I've been listening to everyone's presentation, so I'm, thank you very much. I'm learning a lot. Uh, I'm Lindsay Hansen. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager and Customer Account Manager here at eBridge. And uh, we're Canadian. There's a few of us Canadians on the line today. Uh, what we do is we started in supplier side EDI. So uh, it's a funny story, but we, uh, we had a customer 25 years ago who opened up a storage unit full of hubcaps. And he said to us, I have a major retailer that wants to buy these for me. I have no idea what EDI is. Can you please help me or I'm going to go bankrupt? And that's uh, how we built our business, helping people get their, their items they want to sell into the hands of their customers through EDI uh, to, to sell in store. Or nowadays, as you can tell, uh, online e-commerce is taking off. We help people sell online as well. I read something interesting uh, over the weekend which said that by 2020, the, uh, the e-commerce or online market to North America is going to reach a trillion. 
so that is not going away, and that is uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, e-commerce and how that relates to folks like you on the line that help customers use AX or 365, or maybe you yourself use AX or 365 to do uh, your accounting and back office work. So you might be wondering why I have a picture of a lady punching a guy with an Everlast boxing glove. Everlast is a customer of ours, and they use Microsoft AX. Uh, they also sell those gloves online, in-store, and in a bunch of different places. So I'm going to tell the story uh, from Everlast's perspective on how they use eBridge and how we could help you. So this lady, why she's mad, I don't know, but she needed that glove. Uh, and nowadays, you don't just go into one uh, major retailer. You could go to a bunch of different places to grab that glove. Could be that you go into Target or Costco. Could be that you go into an Everlast uh, location. It could be that this person opened up their phone and went onto Amazon and they're a Prime member and they, uh, they grabbed the, the cheapest gloves they could find and they ordered it in one day. <laughs> or it could be that they went on Everlast.com and ordered the gloves on the web shop that Everlast provides. So my point is that these days, it's not really e-commerce or retail, it's just commerce. And commerce is so many different channels. So as a seller, uh, you need to be ready. And as somebody that cares about the accounting or ERP system that your company uses, you got to be ready to take data from a bunch of different channels. All right, so wherever she ended up buying from, she did make that order. And so I took a picture on the screen here of Everlast headquarters. It's in New York and they use Microsoft Dynamics. So somehow, every time somebody places an order from wherever they got it from, that order information, so that SKU, uh, the credit card, that exact price that day, the tax in that state, all that information, or all that data needs to flow in near real time back to Everlast headquarters in order to keep inventory levels correct, make sure customers are happy and getting their tracking number in time, making sure that product information is correct. So I've talked a lot, but really what it comes down to is somebody needs to be in the middle of all these channels pointing back to Microsoft Dynamics, and that's eBridge. So as I mentioned, we've been doing this for about 25 years. We're a Microsoft Gold partner. We're up here uh, just an hour outside of Toronto, but we service the world, uh, 600 customers, and a bunch of the people in this office that I'm in, there's 60 of us have been working here for a long time. And so we have this knowledge of you know, mapping information from one system to the other. And we've taken all that, that wisdom and we've put it on a purpose-built integration platform called eBridge Integration Cloud. We just moved it over to the Microsoft Azure platform uh, over the last year. So even on Black Friday and Cyber Monday and you know, during that Thanksgiving rush of online orders, our platform and our customers are always alive. So it's pretty amazing. So people think of us as an integration platform that's universal, meaning that today they only sell on eBay, but maybe tomorrow they sell in-store and they also have a Shopify store, for example. So we can flow orders from any of the channels they want to add or remove as they go. So this is really what it looks like. Uh, and I won't bore you with all the details. You're probably very familiar with micro Microsoft Dynamics. We cover Microsoft Dynamics AX. Uh, 365 and all of the suites. We also do um, NAV, SL, RMS, and we've been doing this for a, a long time as a gold partner. And we have a bunch of pre-built connectors for all the things I'm looking at on the left. So ShipStation is a good example, even Salesforce CRM. Anywhere your data is that needs to get back into your ERP, that's where we come in. And again, all hosted on Microsoft Azure. And the tips of the waves here is we're a gold partner. We actually, uh, I'm sure some folks on the line can attest to this, we just became uh, recertified as a gold partner. So a few of our folks in the office had to write some exams and uh, we passed the test and we're all excited. Uh, we also have an app on AppSource. It's called Integrate E-Commerce, CRM, EDI, and more by eBridge Connections. We have a bunch of pre-built connectors and we're always building more. So if your company engages with eBridge and does a one-to-one -one integration, let's say your Shopify orders back into Microsoft Dynamics AX, and then you decide to add something later, it's very easy to do that. 
All right, and we have about 100, or sorry, 600 companies that call us uh, their integration partner. One of the newest ones, uh, Rad Power Bikes, and also Char Griller. So you might be grilling on the big green egg this summer. Uh, they're a customer of ours using a Shopify store. All right, so I'm not going to do a demo. I would love to give you a demo anytime you're ready this week or next week, but I'm going to just show you for about one minute what this looks like that I'm talking about. So somebody would go to their web browser and they would type in ebridgecloud.com and you would log in. And this is what they're presented with. So a customer of ours, let's pretend again that we're Everlast, they use Microsoft Dynamics as their ERP. And what you're seeing here in these boxes are all of those channels they're selling on. So they could double click on WooCommerce, that's an online uh, sales platform. And you can see live all of those things in near real time that are flowing back and forth. So from WooCommerce, any orders for boxing gloves, they almost instantly go back into Microsoft Dynamics. Anytime an inventory needs to be adjusted, obviously minus one pair of boxing gloves would shoot back over to WooCommerce. Any product catalog updates would be in near real time. So as you can see, there's so many channels that a company might be selling on, this pulls them all in and makes it automatic. And then here is sort of this mailbox for eBridge. Uh, and you can see if there was a problem with an order, if a shipment did not go out, or you can just see uh, by channel what orders you've, you've made today, for example. So the cool thing about eBridge is you hopefully, once things are set up, don't need to be in this screen at all. You don't need to be in eBridge at all. We flow in the background. And when you have a problem or you need a health check or you want to check in on an error, uh, you can hop into eBridge, uh, click and dive into what maybe the problem was with a particular order. It keeps everybody honest. <laughs> All right, so back out. Uh, so as I'd mentioned, that was a fast tour of what we do, but you know you don't know where your customer is going to be, um, but you do know that all of that information needs to be back into your Microsoft Dynamics ERP. And so eBridge sits in the middle. We're a bit of a middleware uh, hosted on Microsoft Azure uh, to help you flow your data back and forth in real time. All right, so back out to the gloves, and um, if you have any questions, again, my name is Lindsay Hampson. I'd love to talk to you on LinkedIn or email me. I'd love to have a quick demo with you. Uh, we cover EDI, e-commerce, CRM like Salesforce and Microsoft CRM, and any new APIs you're, you're planning on selling on. We have this nifty planner. It's called Start Planning if you go to our website, and you can tell us the things that you would like to integrate together, and we'll tell you what we've built before. So uh, you're not reinventing the wheel if you're, you're thinking about uh, developing something in-house. It might make more sense to just talk to eBridge and see what we can do to help you out. So that's it. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Jason, and uh, thanks again for having me. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, thank you to all five of our presenters today. Great job to all of you. And uh, it is now time for some Q&A. And uh, some questions have rolled in. If you haven't entered yours yet, please do provide them now, and we'll, we will uh, get to them in, uh, in the order in which they arrive. So um, the first question that came in is actually uh, for Neil McDonald of, uh, of Binary Stream. You know, the question was asking, um, and uh, was asking, can the module that you were uh, demonstrating um, for schedules be utilized for prepaid assets? Yeah, so on the deferral side, absolutely. So we're handling deferrals in both the sales order, the free text invoice on the sales side, purchase order, and uh, voucher journals on the purchasing side, and also just a standard general journal entry. We can handle deferrals of all of those types we looked at across all of those modules, as well as project fees. All right, great. Uh, a question here um, for Crow, um, for, for, for Dan, um, uh, Dan Edwards here. So does the application support the U.S. and international standards in the same legal entity? Great question, Jason, and yes, it does. Since we've adopted the book philosophy similar to what they do in fixed assets, you could actually have one book looking at your asset under ASC 842 and a separate book looking at it under IFRS 16 and all the different transition methods that are available. All right, great. Uh, question here for, um, for Lindsay from eBridge Connections. 
um, basically asking when would it make financial sense to uh, bring integration into the picture? Sure. Um, it's actually a pretty easy answer for that. Uh, it makes sense to engage with an integration platform when you have more than 200 orders uh, a month. That's when it becomes pretty unmanageable to be you know, updating inventory across sites or uh, making sure that orders go in or you know, we all need things the next day after we order it. So placing orders, making sure that UPS is on its way with whatever people have ordered. So we say uh, the, the sweet spot is about 200 or more orders a month. All right. Uh, a question that um, I'm going to pose to um, well, all of you, but I'll start with um, uh, with Anna from DoApp. So uh, the question that came in is, um, can you describe your cloud licensing model? Thank you. A good question. Um, our licensing is in subscription model, which is consumption based on the amount of invoices you have. And uh, this is a rich, free, and flexible way that accommodates uh, with the growth of your business. So scalability is kind of built in. Excellent. Um, Esan, I wanted to maybe uh, just pose the same question to you, and then we'll get to um, uh, all the other uh, presenters as well. And I just want to make sure your line is open as well. I think it's muted. Uh, so, Asan, let me just open up your line here. Why don't you do it? All right. We got it, finally. Uh, okay. Can you repeat the question, please? So the question was um, if asking, can you describe uh, your cloud licensing model? Uh, uh, that's an interesting question. So it's basically we are uh, same as all ISVs. ISVs are uh, if they're uh, offered by Microsoft partners, there is basically a percentage of the Microsoft Dynamics licenses. So it's very similar to that. All right, great. Um, I'd like to just put that same question to. Um, to all, all the others as well. And uh, so, Neil, why don't I go back to you um, on this one? OK, great. Yeah, so our licensing is based on named users. Uh, we don't care about the volume that you process through the system at this point. Um, unless you're using our portal, we do have a portal on the back end for customers to, to come in and pay. But basically, you're, you're purchasing various modules. So it's a subscription billing suite. So we have a price for the suite, which gives you both the um, billing and the deferral functionality. But someone says, you know, I don't need the billing, I just need the deferrals. You know, we can have that module separate. We can have the billing module separate without the deferrals as well. So it's a combination of really what you need. We've got three levels. Um, the entry level is going to have the basic functionality. Each level has more and more functionality, more and more rich features. So we're really trying to tailor it to the, the, the smallest of our customers all the way up to the largest, most sophisticated, and still make the pricing uh, reasonable for everybody. And again, it's based on named users, not on the volume of transactions. All right, excellent. Um, Dan, uh, Dan Edwards from Crow, let me put the same question to you, please. Sure. And our pricing model is pretty simple. It's a subscription model, and we have three different tiers, small, medium, large, based on the number of leases you're going to manage in the system across all legal entities. So all your Dynamics users can use the module. It's just all controlled on how many leases you're going to manage. All right, thank you. And uh, I want to make a, a just a final call for any other questions that you might have out there. We do have. I'm going to ask Lindsay to from uh, eBridge Connections to also take the same question, though. Sure. Uh, again, ours is pretty easy. It's uh, if you never want to type orders from Amazon into Dynamics again, that's one workflow, and we have a monthly or yearly uh, price for that. And so think about you know every workflow that you want to automate. It could be orders or inventory. Um, our product information or adding a new customer into your CRM. That's how we, we price it. And uh, we're similar to a few of you. We don't charge by transaction. So you can have as many orders as you want in a day, and it doesn't matter to us. Um, that's, that's our pricing. Great. Well, uh, well, thanks to all of you so much for taking the time to present, to take these questions today. Much appreciated. Um,
to everyone in the audience as well. Thank you for your time and attention. And obviously, if you want to uh, reach out individually to anybody, the email addresses uh, for contact are up there. Uh, we have recorded today's event. We'll be um, sharing that very soon for all of you to, uh, to review uh, whenever you want it. And uh, with that, we are going to wrap up today's event. Oh, one other note, there is a quick survey that will pop up when you leave. Any feedback you can give would be appreciated. So with that, we're going to conclude. Have a great day, everybody.